Hello. I am William Calvin, a professor emeritus at the University of Washington's Medical School in Seattle. In this third in a series of four talks, I use the the MIT bathtub simulator to show why everything except CO2 removal is inadequate to the task. The task? We cannot back out of the climate's danger zone without cleaning up the last half century of accumulated CO2 emissions lingering in the air overhead. In this talk, I'm going to take a look at how big and quick the proposed cleanup methods are. The calculation is much like simulating a bathtub's inflows and outflows, and MIT has a nice online tool for climate inputs and outputs that I will demonstrate. This third talk is about why emissions reduction is insufficient, why we must remove the excess CO2 from the atmospheric circulation very quickly, in the next 20 years. The elephant in the room metaphor refers to a large issue with influence over a discussion that is not mentioned by the participants. There is now an elephant in the room, being ignored. Big CO2 was named for the 50% excess CO2 accumulation overhead. Will someone please introduce him? Once you have a tooth abscess, a daily limit on the candy isn't going to drain the abscess. We have been conflating slowing further climate change with repair and restoration of the former climate. That's where we are with our exclusive focus on emissions reduction. A CO2 cleanup is now the appropriate focus for intervention. But it must be big and quick, before our capacity for climate repair is hobbled by global economic crashes. Emissions is often used as shorthand for annual emissions, which is a rate like miles per hour, not a quantity like miles traveled. That sloppy usage risks people confusing the annual number with the accumulation over several centuries, since they both get called emissions, even by scientists. But how often does one hear someone saying miles when they mean miles per hour? It is the accumulation in the air, annual emissions integrated over time, that causes our climate problem. Zero annual emissions does not fix it, not in the manner of visible air pollution which nature cleans up with the next good rain. How much longer does excess carbon dioxide stick around? A thousand years, unless we clean it up. Methane only sticks around for several decades and we can counter its warming effects by simply removing some extra carbon dioxide each year. This plots annual emissions and removals the sources and sinks of our excess CO2 problem. It shows the annual amounts added slash subtracted from the existing reservoirs in land, air, and ocean. The top half shows where the excess CO2 comes from. Land use change is all about the carbon taken out of circulation by the plants and trees that formerly occupied those roads and parking lots and buildings. If the trees are not replaced, their decomposition puts CO2 back into the air within a few years. But most of the excess CO2 comes from that release when burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, methane, and the limestone for cement. The fossil fuel CO2 numbers add on another 50% to take account of the CO2 equivalents of methane, the nitrous oxides from fertilizer, the CO2 from making cement, and the minor greenhouse gases. That's the source side. The sink side is below, with equal totals, now about 44 gigatons of CO2 annually. The rising CO2 does indeed fertilize plant growth for a while, though not necessarily the crops, once it gets hotter. The dark blue below is the annual amount taken up by the ocean surface, where it causes acidification that threatens our food supply. Some of that CO2 is sunk into the deep ocean, taking it out of circulation for a thousand years. Pale blue shows what part of the annual CO2 bump up remains in the air, increasing the excess CO2 accumulation. The accumulation, in turn, is what causes the overheating. Stopping emissions does not clean up the accumulation. Here are a number of familiar phrases that all amount to emissions reduction. They do not take circulating CO2 out of circulation, which is what sets us up to cool off. But they remain of value for more general reasons. We need to reconceptualize the climate problem, reframe it for more effective action. The continued framing of climate action as an emissions reduction task, a fossil fuel diet, 
similar to a heavy smoker cutting back to one pack a day, with no additional discussion of backing out of the danger zone for extreme weather, will take us straight into too little, too late and the massive consequences of hopelessness. We do not want to go there. Prevention and treatment often demand different approaches, but that is usually not reflected in major international scientific reports about our climate problem. Civic organizations supporting climate action usually uncritically echo them, focusing solely on rallying the troops to use less. An exception worth noting, the Sierra Club stated the situation much more forcefully in 2019. Action. An unnoticed Sierra Club report in 2019, not even a press release, stated the situation much more forcefully. Action on climate adaptation and carbon dioxide removal must be undertaken immediately. And bold action is essential if we hope to protect and restore our human communities and the natural environment in the future. This work cannot wait for 5 or 10 years, and delay will only make necessary changes harder, less effective, and more expensive. So, why the focus on the root cause of overheating, CO2 emissions, to the exclusion of the knock-ons? First, because the most knowledgeable climate scientists have no training in interventions. For climate, no one does. And yet action is necessary, rather quickly. As I addressed in the second talk of this series, they simply do not think like physicians, who must constantly evaluate the risks of intervening and the hazards of not acting, it's part of the medical mindset. The clock is always ticking. Second, because the focus has not been on fixing the climate, only on slowing the rate at which it gets worse with a fossil fuel diet. That's a very modest goal, we can do better. Third, climate denial has meant there is no public money except for the cheapest strategy, a fossil fuel diet known as emissions reduction. It is failing. And even if it were not, emissions reduction is now far too small for the current threat. Think big. I suppose that getting public buy-in for climate action had to start simple, and the public understands diets. They already understand stopping smoking. They even understand cleanups. But the IPCC did not push it until 2018, and then only in the awkward conceptual context of negative emissions rather than using a word that the public already understood, like cleanup. The love of new buzzwords is making it harder for people to understand the choices. Beware of gradual. There are surges. The notion that we might slowly get into serious trouble by mid-century has been conveyed by the media and understood by at least some political leaders. But that scenario depends on somehow avoiding sudden shifts in climate in the meantime, instant setbacks at a time when we lack maneuvering room. And we are already having sudden surges, that stick, in some aspects of climate. Climate change can be sudden. Don't assume gradual. Climate's future is always presented as if climate consequences would gradually increase, much like the slider on a dimmer switch ramps up the room lights. This is misleading. Climate consequences are not proportional to average temperature in the familiar analog manner. Annual damage can surge while the drivers continue to merely creep upward. In the 21st century so far, we have had sudden surges in five types of extreme weather and each seems stuck in a new mode of operation. That makes more effective climate action urgent. End of the 21st century targets are obsolete. Aim for 2040. And it has also become misleading to talk as if emissions reduction was the most important thing for us to do. It isn't working and doubling down on emissions will not fix our climate. This lecture uses the MIT bathtub simulator to evaluate the proposed climate actions and conclude they are not big enough, even in combination, to do the job that now needs doing. That's what decades of delay, deceit, and half-measures have done to us. Reducing emissions is no longer the best goal for climate action. Most current efforts are still relevant to other environmental goals, but they now count little toward reducing our climate problems. They are worthy for other reasons but should not be characterized as climate solutions when they count so little. The climate problem will not be solved in time with every little bit counts. 
cleaning up the excess CO2 must become the major focus of our climate efforts. And, because of the extreme weather surges, it must now be done very quickly. So, let us tackle the pre-2050 climate crisis action chunks. I sorted the big aspects according to the needed actions and implementation times. Climate crisis aspects that gradually get worse. Effect A. The slow-moving stuff like the expansion of the tropics, desertification, more heat stress, species going extinct. Effect B. Indeed, all standard environmental goals are threatened. But their obvious solutions no longer contribute much to backing out of the climate crisis. They no longer qualify as climate solutions, yet they are all we talk about. Effect C. Sea level rise, very important by 2050. There will be a major coastal refugee crisis unless we protect or relocate residents by the 2040s. Cooling will neither stop nor reverse rising sea level for centuries, as runoffs during hot summers have created rotten ice at the base of the ice sheets moving downhill. Even if their base refreezes to the rock beneath, the newly rotten ice above will fracture easily under shear stresses. Accelerated ice flow downhill will continue. And so cooling will not easily stop sea level rise, not for many centuries. History matters. Fixing overheating and extreme weather will not fix sea level rise as well. Effect D. Ocean acidification. That is 70% of the global surface area. Only CO2 removal will fix the acidification of surface waters. The climate crisis fast action chunks, the sort of event that could happen any time. Effect E. Mega heat waves and other types of extreme weather that surged between 2002 and 2010, stalled hurricanes, billion dollar fire weather, severe floods, and severe windstorms. All need quick cooling by CO2 removal, say by 2040. Effect F. Economic collapse, by synchronous hits around the world when jet stream resonance traps weather systems from moving eastward. Such episodes could happen anytime. Locked in weather, for weeks. That we cannot yet predict when a sudden surge will happen is quite irrelevant. We already know enough to realize that fast action is needed, now. Now that we know something about the deeper parts of the problem, let us spend two slides looking at the misconceptions that the public and governments are currently thought to have. Excess CO2 is like visible air pollution. No. CO2 is not washed out by rain. That makes a 1,000-year difference. CO2 and other greenhouse gases, GHGs, mimic the mechanism for warming a greenhouse. No. In response to incoming infrared, CO2 radiates infrared heat in all directions, half downward. Those glass greenhouse roofs merely stop warm air from rising further. It was an unfortunate choice for a name. We mostly stick to heat trapping these days. Climate problems arise gradually, as CO2 creeps up. No. Remember those five extreme weather surges between 2002 to 2010. Gradual provocation but sudden outcomes. Overheating creeps up with the CO2. Surely that's true, no, at least not from 2002 to 2012 when we had a hiatus in overheating. It also wasn't true before 1976, when CO2 was rising but global temps were not. Such exceptions tell us that something was left out. 5. The expert's standard emphasis on emissions causes overheating implies dieting now needs revising. It was a good summary for the late 20th century. It still is, for children. But not for adults in the 21st century, not the ones carrying the responsibility for acting in time. 6. The excess CO2 removal job is not like the emissions reduction that fixed the 1970s smog, or the reduction in refrigerator gases in the 1990s when the ozone hole was allowing in too much ultraviolet. For excess CO2, Nature's cleanup is far too slow. Some review articles in 2018 surveyed seven proposed carbon dioxide removal, CDR, schemes. 
I am going to compare their maximum claimed rates, left column, to the 270 gigatons of CO2 per year needed to achieve cleanup by 2040, my final talk will show the reasoning. By 2040, that sinks 3,400 gigatons of CO2, drawing it down to 1960s values. As you can see, growing more trees will not get us to our goal. It is 50 times too small, as well as very vulnerable to fire. Nor will the others. I have made a table of the biggest claims made for 2050. Even if we do all of them, to their max, it falls far short. Time, I think, to reevaluate our plans. We need better choices. So let us look at the possible goals for climate action, starting with the most ambitious. Goal A. Climate restoration, restoring the old climate. Thriving again. Goal B. Prevent economic disaster by cooling off quickly, requires keeping extreme weather from triggering mega heat waves, etc. And the only way to do that is to cool things off, before too much damage to civilization is done. Say, finish the job by 2040. Goal C. Cool off someday, nature takes 1000 years, about 30 human generations, to remove 80% of the excess CO2. Unfortunately, that also acidifies the ocean surface waters, so we must remove the excess CO2 some way with climate engineering. You may have noticed that almost nobody discusses these three more ambitious climate goals. Are they really so expensive, compared to the damage that is forthcoming? Then, there is our current half measure, now sure not to work by itself. Goal D keep below 2.0 degrees Celsius above the Paris Agreement baseline. This does not stop extreme weather from surging again. It does not stop sea level rise, nor ocean acidification. It cannot be done with drastic emissions reduction alone, we must also remove excess CO2. There are three ways to treat the overheating created by excess CO2. 1. Emissions reduction only slows the growth of the CO2 accumulation, leaving nature to clean up the excess, which takes a thousand years. 2. Creating low clouds or high haze to reflect some incoming sunlight, called solar radiation management, SRM. And 3. Carbon dioxide removal, CDR, which removes excess CO2 from its recirculation loop, not merely a smokestack. The annual bump up in CO2 concentration has increased more than 50% for the 21st century years. It was supposed to go down that much. That only goes back to 1980. Let us take it back to the late 1950s, when Dave Keeling started regularly measuring CO2 well away from industrial sources, high atop Mauna Loa and Hawaii, about 14,000 feet high and facing into the trade winds from the northeast. Now we can fit straight lines to most segments, showing the slope has increased 250% since the 1960s. As I said, despite some more regional successes, on a global scale, emissions reduction is a failed strategy. Even if it hadn't, it became apparent that nature will take a thousand years to clean up after us, not a century or two. The CO2 problem is not like more familiar forms of air pollution, cleaned up by rainfall. The problem is that the CO2 concentration does not decline exponentially. Unfortunately, CO2 decay has a long tail, taking a thousand years to reach 19%. Were it simply exponential, then fitting to the first 10 years of the decay curve would yield an 18-year time constant, the time to 37%, 1 over E. By 28 years, all but 19% would be gone. But no. It takes a thousand years instead. Nature's cleanup looks like a long tail distribution of the kind my wife and I were studying in nerve cells back in the 1970s, but had first been studied in the days of the first submarine cables in the 19th century. That leaves us, broadly speaking, with two distinct approaches to our long-term overheating problem, shade and cleanup. Shade, aka Solar Radiation Management, SRM tries to bounce back some arriving sunlight and thus cool us off, even though CO2 continues to build up. It is usually presented as trying to mimic the sulfur aerosol haze after a volcano erupts, 
but we have long been unintentionally practicing such geoengineering via smokestack pollution. Currently, a stratospheric aerosol of finely powdered chalk looks like a much safer bet. 3. Cleanup, aka carbon dioxide removal, CDR. The land-based industrial versions are sometimes called negative emissions technology, NET. It has a number of subcategories, such as direct air capture, ocean fertilization, reforestation, push-pull ocean pipes, etc. All good long-term thinking. But now there is an urgent short-term problem arising from the new extreme weather, about which the discussion is only beginning. None of the several dozen CDR proposals adequately addresses the urgency of doing the cleanup job. None of them could remove CO2 fast enough to counter the continuing emissions annually, and thus they will not cool us at all. We have been aiming far too low. Don't confuse prevention with treatment strategies. Many reason, emissions cause the problem. Reducing them ought to fix it. However true for smog cleanup in the 1970s, CO2 is not cleaned up by nature as fast as visible air pollution is, a thousand years versus two weeks. That's critical but rarely mentioned. Today, the continuing emphasis on useless without a cleanup is like treating a painful tooth solely with reduced candy consumption. While emissions reduction was the obvious strategy for CO2 50 years ago, it is only a mild preventative measure, like reducing smoking, not a fix once a disease surges. Things have worsened over a half century, but our strategy has not adapted. Emissions reduction, a rate, not a reservoir, includes almost everything you've heard of. Capping landfill methane release. Capping mine shafts. Fix pipeline leaks. Capture cow barn methane. Plus all of the fossil fuel carbon diets, aim to achieve zero carbon, emissions rate, not accumulation. Smokestack partial CO2 capture comes at the cost of burning more coal. Efficiency improvements in electricity generation in vehicles, and in insulating homes. But emissions reduction does not subtract from the excess CO2 accumulation. It leaves nature to do the job, and only a cleanup can cool us off and back us out of the extreme weather surges. People, in this case, in a public opinion poll, fail to understand that nature's CO2 cleanup takes a thousand years while air pollution is cleaned up within weeks. The check marks are the correct answers. Note that those pairs are all about the same height. That means that people think that CO2 is just like the more visible forms of air pollution. Centuries and more, the last two pairs, mean that only one in four think that cleanup time is a long-term problem. Human conceptual conflation regarding cause also makes climate action more difficult. The flow rate versus reservoir size conflation is common. Here are some other examples besides the emissions rate versus accumulation of excess CO2, emissions reduction versus cleanup. Packs per day versus carbon lumps accumulating in the lungs, cutting back on smoking does not clean up the lungs. Annual debt additions versus the national debt, balance budget versus pay off bonds. Annual gun sales versus guns available for use, restrict sales versus gun buyback to reduce easy access. In each case, it is the accumulation that creates the problem. But leaders choose to focus on the rate instead. Since most people do not distinguish between annual flow rate and the accumulation, the leaders still get credit for doing something when it may only amount to window dressing. That is one way we get trapped, thinking we are doing something about the problem. When we are not addressing the most important aspect, such as the water behind the dam, or the need for an excess CO2 cleanup, or easy gun availability when someone is angry or suicidal. A brief intro to the bathtub overflow problem. It's just like bailing a leaky boat, the outgoing must at least equal the incoming flow or catastrophe soon results. Here is the bathtub that is going to serve as an analog for the CO2 in the air and surface ocean. The main drain is not shown. Consider it plugged. So the overflow drain is where the action is, 
That double-headed arrow shows the overfill that has resulted from adding water, or CO2, faster than the drain can take it away. Just to drain the excess takes thousands of years, if we wait around for nature to do the job. The normal fill line, where a bathtub ring might appear, is the pre-industrial CO2 level of 280 parts per million. We are now at 420 parts per million, so we now have 140 parts per million overfill, a 50% excess of CO2. That is a lot, more than enough to overflow real bathtubs. In the bathtub, we can estimate the disaster line. For climate, we just do not understand the climate systems well enough to make an estimate. But the five surges in extreme weather seen in part one, suggest we may be approaching major shifts. If we were going to design a climate control panel with valves and indicators and switches, here is how we might start. Valves for heat sources and sinks. A thermometer to view the results. A control on the overfill drain outflow, to mimic plugging. A way to measure the reservoir level. A way to quickly drain the reservoir. In practice, this may be a pump with adjustable rate, like a sump pump in a basement close to the water table beneath. Sliders are turned sideways in upcoming slides. Here is the software simulator that MIT created for the climate version of the traditional bathtub. Most of the sliders are sources or concepts related to annual emissions modification. Note that emissions are always annual numbers, but it is their accumulation that sets the temperature trend. Some people say emissions for either, which is rather like saying miles for both miles traveled and for its rate, miles per hour. There is a big difference. The CO2 emissions in the top curve includes equivalents for methane and the other greenhouse gases. That graph at upper right shows the projected temperature rise over the years. Back to the graph at left. The CO2 emissions over this century are plotted in the top curve. That includes equivalents for methane and other greenhouse gases. It totaled 42 gigatons. CO2 removals from the air into land and ocean, is the bottom line, currently totaling 22. The gap area in yellow shows what remains in the air, 20 gigatons, yearly adding to the 50% excess of CO2 that overheats. As they say in the London Underground, mind the gap. It keeps growing. That green box on the right contains the only two removal rates that space on the control panel allows you to simulate. Afforestation is the fancy name for planting trees where there wasn't a recent forest. This slide raises the rate of planting new forests. Then there is the rate at which industrial scale technologies, like the CO2 scrubbers on the International Space Station or on submarines, come online for capturing the CO2 overhead. They require a lot of clean power from windmills and solar panels, so this will take a while to have an effect. And time is now of the essence, as legal contracts like to say. The left and right limits of a slider are taken from current estimates in the review papers for how quickly it might be implemented and the maximum physical capacity. For example, you cannot plant trees where there is not enough water to support trees, and you must leave enough room for agriculture. They have set the upper limit for tech fix carbon recapture at 17 gigatons of CO2 annually. Since the current annual emissions are up at 44, 17 will not cool us a bit. It's just that 17 was what was claimed as an upper limit by proposers of the project. And the underlying spreadsheet emitted ocean-based projects, potentially huge in comparison to their other choices. Models often emit things with a large range of uncertainty, but they really need to flag it with a placeholder or footnote when estimates are incomplete in a major way. Nonetheless, it is now obvious that we need a crash program to invent something an order of magnitude better, more like scrubbing 270 gigatons annually, the topic of my fourth talk. The scrubbers need not involve the ocean, but that's the place which will minimize conflicts in a crisis. One doesn't want a scrubber to halt whenever there is no fuel for trucks, or the power supply becomes essential for air conditioning to cool off the sleepless nights. That top dotted horizontal line, 2 degrees Celsius, does not mean several degrees above freezing, it means a 2 degree temperature rise from a prior reference temperature, usually that in 1750, called pre-industrial. 
it doesn't matter for my purposes as I will always deal with temperature differences, where the baselines cancel out. A more important issue is, exactly how far into the future do you pick to judge the outcome? The end of this century seems to be the default, conveniently two and a half generations away. We do not have that long if we fail to quickly back off from the overheating, given those surges in extreme weather noted in my previous talks. We need to stop our end of the century thinking. It has led to putting off climate action by the current generation and by the prior one, leaving us with few remaining exits on the freeway to hell, before we reach the slippery slope terminus. How about we judge outcomes by mid-century results instead? The extreme weather surges tell us that repairs with lead times are going to be vulnerable. I am going to ignore the second half of this century and just focus on the temperature change between 2020 and 2050. The projection shows about nine-tenths of a degree of further overheating by 2050. We will be judging interventions by how much they reduce that red number. To start cooling, it needs to go negative. Today I will use 2050 but in my next talk, I consider the vulnerability of scrubber projects to extreme weather and the economic crashes that could disorganize society, making big actions difficult. I then move the cleanup goalposts back to 2040. But for today, I will stick to a mid-century point of evaluation for climate actions. Another choice for climate action is a carbon tax to drive down the use of fossil fuels. That gives a tenth of a degree reduction in warming by 2050. It's the big use less among the possible climate actions in the left and center columns. And it disappoints. A quick reminder of those two other ways of fighting the overheating aspect of the climate problem. Those two sliders at the bottom right of the MIT control panel represent two of the various types of cleanup. Growing new forests, with that tiny improvement. And technological, by which they mean land-based schemes such as direct air capture, what's used on submarines. Left out were the ocean-based approaches. Not even a placeholder. The push and pull pair I've added are among the proposals left out, they are, at least, easy to illustrate. All of them need redesigning by experts. We are going to need a lot more scrubbing capacity, probably by several orders of magnitude. Now let us add land-based scrubbers. Slider to the max turns out to be a capacity of 17 gigatons a year. That's only one-third of what continuing emissions will be in 2025. I estimate we will need to scrub 270 gigatons each year to actually cool things off by 2040. Yes, we can try to reduce those continuing emissions, but this is an order of magnitude improvement needed in scrubbing. Which is why we need a Manhattan Project for Climate. Very quickly. Here's the best we can do without an ocean-based CO2 removal project. The result at right fails to achieve any cooling, it is less than halfway there but at least it has stopped rising so quickly. That's about what most people mean when they aspire to stabilizing. Be careful about that word stable. People, including physicians, often don't mean stabilized by that. In the sense of protected by a restoring force against nudges like a marble sitting in the bottom of a saucer, or a roof ladder without riggers to push back when the person on the ladder leans out to reach something. A caution, many people only mean staying about the same when they say stable. But stabilized implies precautions against tipping and a slippery slope. Another sloppy word usage that inadvertently misleads. So, no cooling by 2040, not unless we invent something better quickly. Even if we maximize all emissions reductions and land-based CO2 removal schemes, their combination is not enough to cool us and reduce extreme weather surges. We will need to use what the MIT bathtub simulator left out as controversial, about like my high school biology text emitted evolution, such as nuclear power, however, it only does emissions reduction, so will not cool. They considered ocean-based CO2 removal to be big, a whole project by itself, but forgot to include a placeholder. 
Ocean is now the only place big enough to house enough photosynthesis. Remember that the bathtub simulation takes no account of how extreme weather might disrupt the CDR projects in the meantime, not just with windstorms and floods and fires, but through economic collapse, famine, wars, genocides, pandemics. It won't take a complete collapse of civilization to create a slippery slope. It is their potential for trashing a big repair project that has created the climate emergency. Many people have realized how serious the climate problem has become. Some have volunteered their time and relevant expertise. But for others, their personal skill set does not fit with what climate engineering needs. And so they end up promoting an ineffective diet. On what should they focus instead? At least in the US, I would suggest politics. Many legislators need replacing. Others of our legislators are convinced, and public opinion polls back them up, that voters rate other things higher than climate action, lower taxes, smaller government, wider freeways. CO2 removal now needs to go to the top of the list. Time for another deep breath. Comic relief. From the non sequitur comic strip. The current path we are on with responding to climate has consequences about like the left-hand path. That right-hand path looks like it might lead to climate's Manhattan Project. Though they really ought to be running instead. So, time for another lessons learned. Part 1 introduced us to the surges in extreme weather and the jet stream's role in promoting them. Part 2 introduced us to the mindset problems in responding to the climate emergency. I compared them to the physician's mindset that we teach in med school. Now, Part 3 shows us that most climate solutions are pretty wimpy, that we will have to invent our way out of this crisis. It is extreme weather's potential for trashing a big repair project that has created the climate emergency. Next week, Part 4. While sea level rise is baked in, a climate cooling is still possible by 2040. I will sketch out Climate's Manhattan Project and how to kickstart it. I thank you for your attention. The other three talks in this series can be found on YouTube via the links at williamcalvin.com slash 2021. Until next time. Any questions?